It's September 20th, 1963. A man in a dark suit walks into a post office in El Paso, Texas. He mails three registered letters, then strolls across the street and enters the State National Bank. He approaches the teller and asks for $100 in American Express traveler's checks. As the teller works on his request, the man in the dark suit pulls out a 45 caliber revolver and fires two shots into the ceiling of the bank. As people duck for cover, the man casually exits the bank. An off-duty police officer named Jim Bundren, who is in the vicinity, hears the shots. Believe it or not, I was on my day off. That's Officer Bundren. I heard the shots. Everybody was just, you know, just shocked. Right. And I says, uh, where is he and what's he wearing? And he said, in a blue suit, white shirt, red tie. He, evidently, he had run out of the bank with a gun in his hand. And I know he couldn't have gotten that far ahead of me. Right. When this car pulls out of the alley, then I could see his face was flushed. I could see the white shirt, red tie, and I just, I drew. Uh-huh. And he just, he didn't say anything. Officer Bundren arrests him. And as he's being handcuffed, the man in the dark suit invites the officer to look into the trunk of his car. The officer carefully opens the trunk, and in it, he finds a bizarre collection of cameras, photos, and documents. He had a, a real small Minolta camera. I think in the movies they probably call it a spy camera. Right. And he had his own processing lab with it. I searched his car, and he had pictures of top secret restricted areas, pictures of uh, the inside of compounds, and a lot of pictures of dead bodies. The man in the dark suit is Richard Case Nagel. That's Dick Russell. Richard Case Nagel is a former U.S. Army veteran, three-time Purple Heart recipient, intelligence officer, and CIA operative. Nagel's arrested and charged with attempted bank robbery. And then it is a preliminary hearing. I sat and just talked to him. It's like you and I were talking. And he says, well, I'm glad you caught me. He says, uh, I really don't want to be in Dallas. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he says, you're not sitting there. Nagel was arrested on September 20th, 1963, two months before President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas. This is Who Killed JFK. Sixty years later, what can we uncover about the greatest murder mystery in American history? And why does it still matter today? I'm your host, Soledad O'Brien. Now, last episode, we took you through Oswald's bizarre return to the United States. We met his CIA-connected babysitters, George de Morenshield and Ruth Payne, who were tasked with looking out for him. We discussed the time that Oswald spent in New Orleans, where he was arrested for handing out pro-Castro leaflets. We also introduced you to the CIA's head of counterintelligence, James Jesus Angleton, and his Wilderness of Mirrors. Angleton was known as the poet spy, and he was obsessed with removing Castro from Cuba. Now, it's important to keep all that in mind as we move forward. So what comes next? Okay. In New Orleans in the summer of 1963, while handing out the leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba committee, Oswald gets into a fight with a bunch of anti-Castro activists. He's arrested, and the first thing he does is request to speak to an FBI agent. On September 25th, the White House announces that the president will be visiting Dallas in November. Then we start to see a swell of covert activity. Chess pieces are being moved around the board. Richard K. Snagel, the man in the dark suit who shot two bullets into the ceiling of the bank, he's going to give us insight into how all this covert activity will lead us to a history-changing event. So, Dick, explain to us. Who is Richard K. Snagel? Nagel was a decorated veteran, a Bronze Star Medal winner, and a former intelligence officer. As we mentioned earlier, he first met Oswald in Japan, where they were tasked to try to recruit a Soviet officer to defect. So how did you first encounter Nagel? 
I first heard about him from another JFK researcher in the 1970s. I was intrigued hearing about this Bronze Star Medal recipient that claimed to have known Oswald, so I did some research. I went to El Paso, where he was arrested for the so-called bank robbery. I went through the newspaper and court files there. There were both Secret Service and FBI files saying that he requested, quote, to speak to a Secret Service agent about an urgent matter the afternoon of the assassination. I knew I'd stumbled onto something, so I found out where he lived. I traveled to Manhattan Beach in Southern California, and I just knocked on the door. And this shadowy figure with a scar across his face opens the door and asks me what I wanted. I told him I'd come all the way from New York to interview him. After an uncomfortable silence, he let me in. And once we sat down, I asked if I could tape him. And he looked at me and said, uh, no, but I'm going to tape you. So he turned on his tape recorder and we started to talk. And he spoke cryptically, but it was about knowing Oswald and that he'd been involved in the assassination. For some reason, he seemed to trust me. So we agreed to meet again this time at a seedy dive bar because he was aware that his movements were being tracked. And it was there that he told me that what he knew about the assassination had ruined his life. The two continued to meet for 15 years, and eventually, in 1992, Dick published his 824-page book about Nagel called The Man Who Knew Too Much. So take me back to where this all started for Nagel. In Japan in 1957 and 1958, Nagel was working for a top-secret Army intelligence unit that was closely connected to the CIA. It was called Field Operations Intelligence, or FOI. The American public didn't know that FOI existed until Nagel described its mission in a 1974 court document. He said it was, quote, a covert extension of CIA policy and activity designed to conceal the true nature of CIA objectives. He then went on to say, quote, in the event I was apprehended, killed, or compromised during the performance of my illegal FOI duties, the Department of the Army would publicly disclaim any knowledge of or connection with such duties. In the early 60s, when Nagel came back to the United States, Cuba had become the focus of American intelligence. The CIA gave Nagel the assignment of renouncing his American citizenship and approaching Soviet intelligence to offer his services, much like they'd done with Oswald. And the Soviets then recruited him for their own intelligence gathering. So he became a double agent. Correct. The Soviets gave him two missions. One, penetrate a violent group of anti-Castro Cuban exiles. And two, keep an eye on Lee Harvey Oswald, who had just returned to America. And were those two missions related? At first, there was no relationship between Oswald and that particular group of Cuban exiles. But in the summer of 1963, Nagel went to New Orleans. And that's where he was reconnected with Oswald. He learned that Oswald was being brought into plans that he didn't fully understand, and that plots to assassinate Kennedy were being discussed. Oswald was being primed to be the fall guy. But the Soviets, who had become fully aware of these plans, didn't want Kennedy killed, and they didn't want Oswald to be blamed. They knew it would be pinned on them or Cuba and could trigger a nuclear war. So what did the Soviets want Nagel to do? They wanted him to take Oswald out. You mean to kill him? Yes, They wanted him to take Oswald out. You mean to kill him? Yes. Nagel was trapped. His loyalty was to the United States. He knew he couldn't do it. But he also knew that if he ignored the orders from the KGB, they would take him out. Talk about between a rock and a hard place. So what does he do? First, he tried to warn Oswald that he was being used. So walk me through that. How did he warn him? He meets with Oswald in Jackson Square in New Orleans and tries to explain to him that the group of Cuban exiles he's been associated with are not who they say they are, and that he is being used by extreme fascist elements to attempt an assassination on Kennedy in order to justify invading Cuba. Nagel told me that when Oswald heard this, he was, quote, visibly shaken, but denied there had been any discussion about killing Kennedy and just shrugged him off. Nagel knew that when he couldn't convince Oswald, his life would be at risk. So he figured the safest place for him was to be in prison. 
He told me that just before shooting up the bank, he mailed a registered letter to J. Edgar Hoover detailing what he knew about the assassination plot and sent another warning letter to his handlers in the CIA. Then, to back up his story, he placed a notebook in his car that contained information that only someone on the inside would have had. Several of the notations were virtually identical to what the authorities later found among Oswald's possessions. They both had small Minolta spy cameras. They both had leaflets for the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. And they both had the same unlisted phone number for the Cuban embassy in Mexico City. Did getting arrested save him? It kept him alive for a while, but it ended up ruining his life. He was in prison for four and a half years, part of which he spent in a psych ward. That's how they began to build out a narrative that he was nuts. So... As a person who's interviewing him, because you're writing your book, how do you navigate that question of his credibility? How do you decide, you know, what's true? First, you assess the existing evidence, which means Nagel's notebook, the fact that he had an ID card for Oswald showing up in his lawyer's files, and the newspaper accounts of his trial in El Paso, where he tried to bring up Oswald and the assassination. Second, interview as many people as possible who knew him, and I found many who attested to his background and credibility. A couple of these, Jim Garrison and attorney Bernard Fensterwald Jr., told me Nagel was the most important living witness to what happened on November 22, 1963. And I realized that the powers behind the cover-up were determined to marginalize him. First, paint him as crazy. Then, after he got out of prison, the CIA tracked his movements, and there were a number of attempts on his life. How long were you in contact with him? I met with him periodically for more than 20 years. And during that time, I saw a man who was torn. He wanted to come clean, to reveal what he knew. But he knew that if he told everything, he'd be killed. So he would drop hints to steer me in the right direction. Like Deep Throat in Watergate. Right. At one point, he told me that if anything happened to him, there was a record of everything he knew that he kept stored in various locations and that only certain people were aware of. And he believed that's what kept him alive. So he did manage to stay alive. For a while. Then in 1995, when the Assassination Records Review Board was doing its investigation, they heard me talk about Nagel at a conference and decided that they wanted to interview him. On the day the subpoena arrived at his apartment, Nagel was found dead. So you believe that Nagel was killed before he could talk? Let me answer that this way. When I called his son to tell him about his father, his son told me that his apartment had just been broken into and was ransacked. Then he told me about his key his dad had left in his apartment to a storage unit in Tucson. And that in that storage unit was a purple trunk, which contained material his father had kept hidden for years. When he heard what had happened to his dad, Nagel's son flew to Tucson to check the storage unit. He opened it up, looked inside, and the only thing missing was the purple trunk. So was Nagel killed before he could talk? Yeah, I believe he was. And he wasn't the only one. What happened to Nagel happened to others? Remember George DeMornschild, Oswald's babysitter in Dallas? Yeah, you said the last time he talked about the assassination was in an interview he did with a journalist in 1977. What happened after that? A little over a decade after testifying to the Warren Commission that Oswald had acted alone, DeMorne Schill decided he was going to tell the truth about what he knew. So he wrote a manuscript titled, I'm a Patsy, I'm a Patsy, which was later published posthumously as a book titled, Lee Harvey Oswald, As I Knew Him. When DeMorne Schill started to go public, the House Select Committee decided to summon him. DeMornshield was living in Florida at the time, not far from Gayton Fonzi. Remember, Gayton Fonzi is the journalist who challenged Arlen Specter on the single bullet theory. At the time, Fonzi was working as an investigator for the committee. Fonzi goes to DeMornshield's house to talk to him. He isn't home, so he leaves his business card with DeMornshield's adult daughter. He tells her uh, he'll be calling later that night to set a time for a formal questioning. And so when the marshal arrives home, his daughter tells him about Fonzie's visit, gives him Fonzie's business card. The marshal puts the card in his pocket, goes upstairs, 
and the next morning he's found dead with a bullet in his head, with Fonzie's business card still in his pocket. They said he'd committed suicide, but his wife told me it was definitely not a suicide, and Nagel told me the same thing, that he was murdered before he could testify. There was also mob boss Johnny Roselli. Right before he was supposed to testify, he was found chopped up, stuffed into an oil drum, and dumped into Biscayne Bay. There were a number of people who died mysteriously. Within three years after the Warren Commission report was released, 18 key witnesses died of either a heart attack, an accident, or suicide. Something that has always fascinated me is the people who were tangentially involved, but managed to survive. Like Ruth Payne. Like Ruth Payne. You'll remember Ruth Payne as one of the CIA-connected people who became close with the Oswald family when they returned to the U.S. On September 25th, the White House formally announces that the president will be taking a tour through Texas, stopping at Dallas on November 22nd. That same week, Marina accepts Ruth Payne's invitation to have her and her baby move in with her in Dallas. Then in early October, six weeks before the assassination, Oswald returns to Dallas, takes a room at a boarding house, and gets a job in a building positioned directly along what will be President Kennedy's motorcade route. And who do you think helped him get that job? Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne. There are so many pieces to this picture. And 60 years later, pieces are still falling into place. So, Rob, where do you go from here? Nearly 5,000 records remain withheld. Do you think that in those records is one piece of evidence that details the whole plot? Well, I don't. I really, I don't. The CIA most likely destroyed anything that would be obviously groundbreaking decades ago. So then what you're both saying is that in all the remaining records, there's no smoking gun. I don't think there's anything left that would be considered a smoking gun the way we think of it. The closest thing we have to a smoking gun is a document that the Pentagon kept secret for almost 40 years. This document outlined a plan called Operation Northwoods. The Joint Chiefs of Staff drafted Operation Northwoods in 1962. It remained a secret until decades later when it was quietly declassified in compliance with the JFK Records Act. But even after the document was declassified, the plan didn't reach the public until 2001, when the investigative reporter, James Bamford, revealed the full details in his book, Body of Secrets. He calls Operation Northwoods, quote, what may be the most corrupt plan ever created by the U.S. government. Here's Jefferson Morley. Operation Northwoods is one of the most significant revelations about the JFK assassination to come out in the last 25 years. Operation Northwoods posed this question. What if something were to happen that would convince the American public that the U.S. had to invade Cuba? Something that would force America's hand? Well, stage a violent incident on a prominent target in the United States, and we'll arrange for it to look like Castro did it. Northwoods was what people in the intelligence business call a pretext operation, where you create a pretext for an action, or sometimes called a false flag operation. When you hear the terms false flag or conspiracy theory, you think of people wearing tinfoil hats. But the U.S. government has had a history of false flag operations. In 1898, the sinking of the USS Maine got us into the Spanish-American War. The USS Maine was a U.S. battleship that mysteriously exploded in Havana, Cuba in 1898. Remember the Maine was the famous rallying cry after the press claimed that Spain was to blame for the explosion, which killed 268 sailors. When the government declared war on Spain, they had the overwhelming support from the American public. And that's how the Spanish-American War started. There was also the firing on U.S. ships in the Gulf of Tonkin in August of 1964, which got us into the Vietnam War. And in 2003, the assertion that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction 
was used to justify the invasion of Iraq. False flags and disinformation can be very effective tools to rally public support. This is in the actual Operation Northwoods document. Here's what it says. The Joint Chiefs of Staff have considered the attached memorandum for pretext, which would provide justification for U.S. military intervention in Cuba. The Northwoods plans were very detailed. We'll fake the hijacking of a plane, and we'll take the plane somewhere, and we'll say that Castro did it. Understand, people who would die on that plane would be American citizens. This phrase is actually written into the Northwoods plan. Quote, Casualty lists in the U.S. newspapers would cause a helpful wave of national indignation. Basically, killing American citizens. That's astounding. A hijacked plane wasn't the only option. Operation Northwoods lists 11 other ideas for, quote, well-coordinated incidents that would look credible, including sinking ships and burning aircrafts. Uh, There's one more part that I'd like you to read. Okay, here's what it says. The desired result from the execution of this plan would be to place the United States in the apparent position of suffering defensible grievances from a rash and irresponsible government of Cuba and to develop an international image of a Cuban threat to peace in the Western Hemisphere. Operation Northwoods was kept hidden from the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee. It was only declassified in 1997. Did Kennedy know about Operation Northwoods? Kennedy knew about it. What was Kennedy's response? He rejected it in in pretty brusque, almost rude terms. But on November 22, 1963, a spectacular attack on a U.S. target occurred, and the immediate response was to blame Cuba. November 22, the day President Kennedy was murdered. So you're saying the plan that President Kennedy rejected was the plan they used to kill him? Right. It was a violent act against a prominent American target. And they had their allegedly pro-Castro assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, to take the blame. And so that's what happens. Within hours of Kennedy's assassination, Oswald is arrested and CIA propaganda assets go to work to link him immediately to the Castro government. And those those efforts are quite successful. We have the headlines the next day, pro-Castro marksman kills the president, pro-Cuban assassin. Robert Blakey, former chief counsel and staff director of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, told us something similar. If what happened is what I think happened, I think that Lee Harvey Oswald was developed as a false flag assassin. On the next episode of Who Killed JFK? President Kennedy had alienated much of the U.S. establishment by the time he was killed in Dallas. We look directly at our three main suspects. That Miami CIA field office is more or less the puppeteers of this whole operation. I asked my mom, where's Papa? And she said he's in Dallas on business. I'm telling you, there's no way in hell that it could not have been a conspiracy. Who Killed JFK is hosted by Rob Reiner and me, Soledad O'Brien. And our executive producers are Rob Reiner, Michelle Reiner, Matt George, Jason English, David Hoffman, and me, Soledad O'Brien. Our writer is David Hoffman, with research by Dick Russell. Our story editors are Rob Reiner and Julie Pinedo. Our senior producer is Julie Pinedo. Our producers are Tristan Nash, Dick Russell, Michelle Goldfein, and Amari Lee. Our editors are Tristan Nash, Julie Pinedo, and Marcus DeLauro. Our project manager is Carol Klein. Our associate producer is Emilce Quiros. Mixing, mastering, and sound design by Ben LaHoulier. Research and fact-checking by Girl Friday and Emilce Quiros. Archival audio in this episode, thanks to the Assassination Archives and Research Center and Dick Russell. Business Affairs by Hernan Narea and Jonathan Furman. Our consulting producer is Roseanne Gallini. Recorded in part at CDM Studio and 4th Street Recording Studio. Show logo by Lucy Quintanilla. Special thanks to Joe Honig, Rose Arce, and Dan Storper. 
If you're enjoying the show, leave us a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. Who Killed JFK is a production of Soledad O'Brien Productions and iHeart Podcasts.